Hi everybody, so if you checked out video 1972, you'll know that I'm burbling on about continuously variable transmissions, and that's because we can use it in a wind turbine. A CVT will match the variable input to a fixed output, and so we can get the best performance from a generator even though the wind speed may change. Now the easiest one, the one we looked at was this one, which is the Evans cone drive. And it works because at any position along the cone, the cross section, the diameter of that position is different. So at this end, the diameter is small, this end, the diameter is big. And of course, if we rub the two together, we get a gear ratio. Here we've got exactly the opposite, big diameter, small diameter, and so the gear ratio will change. Now in 1979, we used a ball that we ran along that to be able to interface between the two and get them to do that, which is pretty cool. However, that kind of CVT does have its issues. It's only really about 80, 90% efficient, 80 really, I'm being generous. And of course, that's because it relies on friction. Now I did mention there's another kind of drive called the ratcheting CVT. And the benefit of that is it's able to transmit an awful lot of torque, properly made, there's no slippage, and it can be very efficient. Now this isn't something that scared people, obviously. There's quite a lot of ratcheting drives out there, include a couple that have been fitted to bicycles and there's an awful lot of really interesting research on designs of ratcheting CVTs and if you have a look in Google Scholar don't waste your time on the main Google page go to Google Scholar put in ratcheting CVT you'll probably get about two or three thousand competing designs that are all really really interesting working on the same principle of course I was thinking about that and I came up with this in Tinkercad and the files are available and the link is down below in the description. Now although I did this on Tinkercad as a 3D printed model, I think that most of these parts could be reproduced using bits that you find around so that you could make it based on the same principle. Now the heart of the system are these four bits here. Those four bits form a pivot. So I printed off the four bits. Now in addition, you're gonna need these. These are actually stock self shelf supports. They're stainless steel, 25 millimeters by six millimeters. Buy them on Amazon and they're pennies. And the other thing you're gonna need are some bearings. And these are 12 millimeters on the outside, six millimeters on the inside and four millimeters deep. And the other thing you'll need is an eight millimeter bolt and an eight millimeter nut. So you take the slide guide here, which is this bit, and there's a hole in that section, jab one of these self shelf supports in there, and then you'll see there's a hex at the bottom and we need to glue the nut into the hex. Take that bit, now this needs to have that bit facing upwards and the nut facing downwards with that facing out so that these three shapes here line up because we put that nut bolt into there and it goes into the nut and that is gonna be how we raise and lower what is a slide guide. Once we've done that, we take the other slide guide half and we pop it onto that structure like that. Once we've done that, we get this. Now we're able to raise and lower that pivot point by twisting that nut. That will bring the carrier up or push the carrier down, changing the pivot point here. And that matters because as it's in the center, if we move this backwards and forwards, we'll get the same range of movement at the bottom. But if we move that up, so that it's like that, and we do a movement there, we get the same range of movement here, but we get a much larger range of movement here. So moving this pivot point up and down, keeping this bar in the same relative location, will change what we're able to do. So if we move the pivot point down, then for the same range of motion here, we get a much smaller range of motion there. So that's the heart of the system. It's how we achieve the continuously variable transmission by moving the pivot point. Now, when we're doing the Evans cones, they had to rub, but there's very little pressure on this pivot point here, it's just a pivot point. And so we're able to move this up and down much more easily than we're able to move a ball in and out. Now, of course, what we need is a way of pushing that backwards and forwards and a way of pushing, turning this backwards and forwards into a circular motion. Now, to push that backwards and forwards, there's a whole host of ways you can do it. Hey, loads of people doing loads of different things. We're going to use this, which is a Scotch yoke. And you can see we made this before out of wood. So there's loads of ways you can make a Scotch yoke and you'll find Scotch yokes all over the place. They're in jigsaws, for example. And what happens is if I turn 
turn this wheel, that peg goes around. Because it's in a slot, then it forces this to go backwards and forwards. And so we're turning a circular motion into a, a linear motion, and we can use that to drive our pivot arm. To make that, you're going to need these bits. In the wheel, I've put another one of our dowel pins, and there's a bit of 8mm bar, and that's the input bar. In the base plate, and I've put a 22mm uh, by 8mm washer, it's a skater bearing, and the wheel goes into that there so it can turn freely. You'll notice these two, those two are to take these square slide guides which fit into there, and then the yoke has two sections to it. It has a flat section and a rounded section. The flat section faces towards the machine, and you'll have seen a small ring piece there that gets another one of those uh, six millimeter stops. So that glues right onto the end of the bar, but you can't put it on yet. First of all, you've got to put the squares on. So you put the square pieces on and then glue on this, then glue this on, and then attach those squares to the base unit. Then the base unit gets glued onto there. So I use these bits to make little caps, and we've got them there. One, two, three. It stops everything being thrown off. And then we've got a spacer and a handle so that I can just turn that, and then the pivot point is raised up and down. And I can do that even though I'm turning my input shaft here. So my turning of the input shaft creates a throw there. That throw has a difference. It's shorter here than it is here when the pivot point is higher. Because the throw is now longer, we turn that back into a circular motion with a ratchet, we will have a continuously variable transmission. The final bit, you'll need these parts. That's the ratchet, that's the ratchet cover. They just press fit and a bit of eight mil bar goes through there. And that is the ratchet carrier. It needs some 22 mil bearings in those holes and that fits on there like that. This is the pole. This goes onto this section here fitting on there with the teeth pointing down that way. And we use one of our shelf supports to do that. When you've finished it, that's what you get. Now this is the input shaft. And as we turn that input shaft, then that rides along that way. And of course it's a ratchet, so it rides up and doesn't turn the wheel. As we continue to turn it, of course, it then pulls it turning that wheel. And the amount that that wheel will turn is set by the position of that pivot. The lower down the pivot, the further that will pull, the higher up the pivot, the less it will pull. And so that's where we get our variable transmission from. Now, you will have noticed it's only working on the pull. So this only works half the time. What you actually do is duplicate the ratchet and pull, the arm and the scotch yoke on the reverse of this, because all this does is raise up the slide. So on the reverse of this, you would have exactly the same. But instead of working it when it was there, it would be set so it was there. So for a full turn, you will be getting pull all of the time, and that's uh, how these ones work. Now, one of them isn't enough. You really need three. One will work, but you really need three. You get a much better performance because these ratchets work by summing the uh, number of times. They're actually in step, and if you add them together, then they sum together, and so you get the um, best out of it every 120 degrees, which is three of these units. Now, of course, we've used this ratchet and pull system because it's dead simple. It does have a little drawback if there's no load on the output shaft, the ratchet won't engage properly. So with a, a load on the output shaft, you get beautiful performance. However, they are made with these things too. You might remember this. This is a roller clutch. It only turns one way. They're just like the ratchet and pole, and you can use that instead of this ratchet and pole mechanism if you want. You might remember this, where it doesn't matter which way you turn this, the output always turns in the same direction. You could attach this bar to here with the linkage like a steam engine and rotate that either whichever way you want and you'll get that to rotate. So you can make this more complicated if you want. This is very much this simple version to show you how it works and to show you that it can be made relatively easily. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.